Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had uh, a coffee and you're ready for the morning session. Um, I've just been speaking with Antoine here, who's from Lyon, which is one of my favorite cities in France. And there's a thriving Bitcoin community there called Bitcoin Lyon. More French, yeah? How many French do we have in the house today? Bonjour les Français. Hello, welcome, bienvenue. Um, so I'm going to leave you in Antoine's very capable hands. Um, just wanted to shout out Bitcoin Lyon, because those guys are fantastic. Um, uh, there's actually a few pieces about them on Cointelegraph, which is, of course, the company I work for. I, I just do this because I really, really like Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, um, over to you, Antoine, who's going to talk to us all about Miniscripts today. Can we get a round of applause, please? Thank you. <laughs> all right, so uh, my name is Antoine Fonceau. I'm uh, contributing to Bitcoin Core and to a few other Bitcoin open source projects. I co-founded so Wizard Sardine, the company working on Revolt and Liana. So Revolt is this Vault implementation that does not use Covenant, but does not use deleted key Covenant neither. People are always confused when you talk about pre-send transaction Covenants that you have to delete keys. You don't have to necessarily, but uh, it's still complex. And uh, so yeah, and Revolt has been using uh, Miniscript for the past three years. And Liana, on the other hand, is a pretty simple uh, Bitcoin wallet that allows you to use advanced uh, recovery features thanks to Miniscript as well. Uh, so uh, Miniscript is finally trending. So uh, that's cool. You probably heard that uh, the watch only support was merged in uh, Bitcoin Core, well, uh, released in Bitcoin Core 24.0. And the signing support was merged in Bitcoin Core Master and it's pro probably going to be released in 25.0. Um, you can try out, well, experiment with Miniscript uh, using the Bitcoin Core wallet now and also with Liana, who is, uh, which is internally using the Bitcoin Core wallet as well. You can also uh, use the great project, uh, the BDK library, if you want to experiment with Miniscript from uh, codes. So, uh, yeah, you, at this point, you've probably heard about Miniscript and that this allows you to use more advanced scripts, more complex scripts, and that this relates to output descriptors, that you can use Miniscript inside output descriptors. And I wanted to take the opportunity of this more technical Bitcoin conference to present actually how it works. So it's only a 20 minute talk, so I won't go into the specific uh, of uh, how it works concretely, but I want to get the intuition and the insights of the type system through. So then you can just fill in the blanks with the actual types if you're interested in going further. So Miniscript is a framework for safely using Bitcoin scripts. Uh, I explain uh, just in a few minutes what I mean by using and what I mean by safely using. Bitcoin uh, Miniscript was created by Peter Völler, Andrew Polstra, and later joined by Sankat Kantalka. Um, Miniscript is not a compiler, so there is always very often this confusion, especially from people that tinkered a bit with Miniscript on uh, CPaaS websites, because you have the uh, Miniscript policy language that compiles to Miniscript, but Miniscript is really a framework to reason about Bitcoin scripts, so Miniscript fragments map one to one to Bitcoin scripts, a set of Bitcoin script upcodes. So it's not a compiler. And so yeah, it's a framework that maps and that models a subset of Bitcoin scripts. You can't use all Bitcoin upcodes in mini scripts, but it allows you to do anything that's interesting to do with Bitcoin scripts, uh, aside from a few optimizations that could not be modeled into, in, into the language. And yeah, so, so that's what a, a script looks like. It's pretty close to, to the Bitcoin policy language that you might be familiar with from CPES website, but you can see that it's different because you have type informations and the policy language you have ands and ors, but there you have different types of ands, uh, different type of ors that you can use only in, in specific situations for specific types. So Miniscript allows you to state, statically analyze uh, a Bitcoin script. So it allows you to analyze the spending conditions of Bitcoin scripts, its semantics, so what keys can spend when, and it gives you 
guarantees about this analysis of the semantic of the Bitcoin scripts. It guarantees to you that the analysis is consensus sound, which means that you, you can't bypass uh, the semantics given by the miniscript. For instance, if, the, uh, if miniscript tells you, well, this script is key A immediately or key B after 42 blocks, something like you can do with Liana, you don't have a key C that can actually bypass the other two. Miniscript is going to tell you all the spending conditions and there is no way around uh, going around it, uh, even by consensus rules. And also, this analysis is standardness complete, such as, well, it gives you standardness complete guarantees. Uh, it's not all miniscripts are standardness complete, but it gives you, it allows you to make sure that a uh, script is complete, which means that by standardness rules, you know that all the spending passes in the miniscript will be spendable by uh, standardness rules, so that basically you can't get stuck. If you get into a script with another party, and you analyze it by miniscript, and miniscript tells you it's safe, go ahead, it's consensus sound and it's standardness complete, you know that there is not going to be a third party that can bypass the rules, and you know that you're always going to be able to spend the scripts, so that you're not going to get blackmailed by the other party. Uh, got into the script with me, if you want to see your money back, you have to give me 99% of it. Um, in addition, uh, so yeah, and it's consensus and standardness here because uh, obviously standardness rules are stricter than consensus rules. So you want to be sure that you can always spend by standardness and that it can't be bypassed by consensus. Um, it also allows you to analyze all those properties of uh, scripts, such as the witness size or the maximum witness size of a spending uh, input, such as you can predict the maximum size of a spending transaction uh, eventually. That's pretty useful, for instance, if you get into pre signed transaction contracts, uh, such as uh, we did with Revolt. So you can plan ahead your fee reserves if you want to do fee bumping, and you know that uh, even if your spending path, for instance, is using 100 witness units, you're not going to have another spending path that is going to use 1,000 or 10,000 witness units, such as it can inflate the transaction size, because witnesses are not committed to base signatures, obviously, and uh, decrease the transaction fee rate. Um, yeah, also all sorts of uh, other resource cost analysis, and it also allows you to reason about malleability, but uh, when we talk about malleability here, is third-party malleability. So not malleability from other participants in the script, in the contract, but from uh, other parties, like other nodes and the network, whether they can malleate witness uh, from a valid witness into another valid witness. And, of course, generic signing and compatibility. Uh, so before Miniscript, basically, you would have template and hard-coded template. So that's a P2WPKH. That's a P2WPKH. And so the wallets are going to be able to match this template, are going to have hard-coded uh, witness templates. If you want to spend from a check mold seek, you have this hard-coded template, and you need to fill in the blank with these signatures. And if you want to introduce a new way of doing uh, uh, mold six, then you, you need to have a new art coded template that always need to be matching against, that always need to know how to create witnesses against, that all hardware signers need to also implement to be able to understand and match, I don't know, change addresses or to just be able to sign. That's not very scalable. And so Miniscripts allows, once uh, it's implemented by wallets or by a signer, to be able to use any spending conditions that can be uh, describes in Miniscript, so it's pretty powerful and composable as well. You can have, uh, so a way of explaining compatibility is like, today you can have a two out of three between three keys, but then you could, in Miniscript, you could have a two out of three between three policies, and each of the person taking part into the mode seek can have themselves a two out of three inside, or themselves a recovery pass, a time lock recovery pass within the, the mode six. We also introduced, so that's why I was uh, saying that uh, not all miniscripts are standardness complete. We have valid miniscripts, 
which are well-typed mini scripts, and then we have sane or safe mini scripts. That's valid mini scripts that are also non-malleable, that third parties and the networks can't malleate uh, satisfactions into other valid satisfactions, that do not contain time lock mixes. So, uh, as you know, in time locks, uh, time locks are basically an introspection and a spending transaction, in the, either on the end sequence field of the input or the end lock time field of the uh, spending transactions for the absolute lock times or the end sequence for the relative lock times. Each of the time locks can be uh, expressed either in, sequen in seconds or number of seconds or in blocks. But since you're using a single field, you can't have a time lock that is expressed both. You can't satisfy both a second time lock and a blocks time lock. You have to choose. But with Miniscript, you could compose two different types of time locks. So we analyze it, uh, this. Uh, but you could have a valid Miniscript with time lock mixes, and you definitely don't want to do that because then you can spin. No duplicated keys as well is for the malleability because then it becomes hard to reason about the malleability because uh, a signature for one key and one side of the script is going to uh, unlock some passes on the other side of the script and it becomes really hard to reason about uh, turning some satisfactions into other satisfactions. And also like the maximum resource consumption is okay on all the spending passes. That's what I was talking about with standardness completeness. So, recap, you have Bitcoin scripts, some Bitcoin scripts are valid mini scripts, and some valid mini scripts are sane or safe mini scripts. Uh, mini scripts allows you to write and analyze uh, some Bitcoin scripts in a safe way. Uh, it gives you guarantees that you're not going to get uh, your money stolen when you're using, using mini scripts or get stuck and blackmailed. We have this concept of validity and sanity. All right, so before diving into this type system, I wanted to give you, uh, to hint you at to why we actually need mini scripts. Bitcoin scripts is hard. So it's not the best example I could come up with, I just uh, got them. But uh, I want to present a couple of scripts there, blocked scripts that I came up with. And I want you guys to tell me why they actually don't do what they were planned to do. That's pretty simple. Uh, it's just a key after 100 blocks. That's the expected semantics. Why is it wrong? Does anyone have any idea? I actually want you, you guys to, to have a look and try it. This one is very simple, the other ones are hard. Yeah? Ah, yeah. <laughs> no. Missing Bob is not the answer. <laughs> so, no, it's just that uh, check sequence verify was a soft fork by OpNOP. And uh, we cannot modify the uh, stack size to t for the opcodes introduced to be a soft fork. So, check sequence verify after execution is actually going to leave the hundreds that is pushed on the stack. So, if you want to spend, you're going to put the end sequence to 100, and you're going to provide a, a signature for the public key of Alice, but then during the execution, it's going to validate that the end sequence is superior or equal to 100. It's going to continue execution, but it's going to leave 100 on the stack, and so it's going to execute the check sig with the Alias pub key, and the signature being the 100 pushed, and that's never going to be a valid signature, so you're never going to be able to spend your funds. So you need a, a drop, you need to, to drop the uh, leftover. All right, slightly more difficult. So the expected semantic is either, so this one, sorry, sorry it's bad. Uh, so the expected semantic is either alias immediately or bub after 100 blocks, typically what Leona does. Uh, if it was a check sig verify, Bob would never be able to spend us. Uh, so let, let's go through it from the two spending passes. Passes, two spending passes. So 
you want to spend as alias. So you provide a signature for our alias, and you execute the check sig. The check sig is going to verify the signature, provided that the signature is fine. It's going to push one on the stack. It's going to get duplicated. So you have two one on the stack. It's going to execute not if, so it's going to uh, wipe one of the ones out of the stack and not execute the condition since it's not if. And so it's going to go through the end of the script with one on the stack, Alice can spend. What's, what about Bob? If you want to spend as Bob, you need to dissatisfy the check sig. So you are going to put an empty vector as a check sig as a signature for Alice, and it's going to execute the check sig and it's going to put zero on the stack. It's going to get duplicated, and then not if is going to execute the, uh, with zero, so it's going to actually get into the conditional. It's going to verify the time lock. We have an up drop, so time lock is fine. But you actually get to the check sig for Bob with still a zero on the stack. So it's, Bob is never able to spend. And this one is, is rather uh, sneaky because you can you, you could, for instance, if you are not testing your, your software properly, you could have function tests of your wallet and that were always using uh, Alice spending pair and never notice about it. Like, my wallet is working, everything is fine, but actually by the time that you want to use your recovery key, you actually can't spend. So what you need is you need an if dup to duplicate only if the tap stack item is one. It's actually pretty interesting uh, upcodes. It's the only upcodes in Bitcoin scripts that conditionally modifies the stack. So that's good. No. Um, uh, and then this one. So yeah, I, I, I go quicker through this one. Oh, it's actually already 20 minutes. So I, I definitely go to quicker. This one is a script with uh, four legs, as you can see. You can see there is one key check there, a second one, a third one. And then you have some sort of relative lock time uh, check. At the end, we have a three equal. So we can infer that it's actually a threshold. We want three out of the, three, uh, of the four legs to be satisfied. So to do that, we have a check sig. Uh, so you can either spend with all the keys or any two of the keys, but only after a time lock. So let's say you want to spend uh, with all the keys. You provide a, a witness that is th the three signatures and a dissatisfaction for the up, 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 if here. So check the first signature. It's going to push one on the stack, and then it's going to swap to get the signature and the one after. It's going to check sig the next signature. It's, you are going to have two one on the stack. It's going to add them, so it's an accumulator. It's a counter of the number of policies that are uh, actually passed. And uh, so it's going to swap again. You have to, going to have two, and uh, going to have the signature on top of the stack. It's going to check it. If it's faded, it's going to push one. You add it. You have three. Then you have uh, a swap again. It's going to put the empty vector on top of the stack. Empty vector is going to get uh, duplicated not going to get into the conditional, so you have three empty vector, you get to the add, it's going to actually add an empty vector to three, but that's fine. Uh, <laughs> and you are going to have three up equal, that's equal to three, that's going to push one on the stack you can spend. If, same if you want to actually satisfy the time lock. Only the time lock, you dissatisfy the signatures at the same logic, but you are going to get inside the if, and uh, it's going to verify the time lock. There is a verify that works as the drop, but you, it's going to stop the execution if you get, in, in, uh, if you get it wrong. Same if you want to satisfy with two other keys. Ah, no, that's a solution. <laughs> okay, so, and you, you need to provide at least two signatures in order to be able to spend this script, even after the time lock. Or do you? Actually, you don't, because, uh, ah, yeah, I forgot to tell you, but we're not doing the quiz properly anyways. Um, you, this is under P2WSH context, and under P2WSH context, we don't have the minimal 
if uh, rule as a consensus rule. We have it as a standardness rule. And therefore, a miner could spin this script without providing any signature, just by uh, passing a three to satisfy the if. And since uh, it's not going to be checked that it's only one, it's going to work as if it satisfied uh, all the, the, uh, the legs, the different policies, at, at least three of them, and it's going to satisfy these three at equal, and you, the miner would be able to spin. So it's not a very good example because that's uh, a bug uh, that was found by Andrew Polstra in Miniscripts last year. But uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a good, uh, I think it's a good instance of a soundness bug. Uh, well, well, you think that your script is doing what you think it's doing, but it's not doing what you think it's doing, and so you people can just steal your money. So I hope that, and that's a pretty simple script compared to what people are using today. For instance, uh, if you check out uh, the HTLC script you use on Lightning, that's way more intricate. So the, hopefully this illustrates how Bitcoin script is hard, and how, how can we get something that we can reason about out of this? So that's where the type system comes in. We are going to separate uh, these app codes into smaller chunks like, that we are going to call fragments, and we are going to uh, give them and uh, properties, or not give them, but uh, just to notice that they do have some properties. Uh, for instance, here you have this fragment that is a key check, a PK in, uh, in output descriptors, a C colon PKK in, uh, in Miniscript, and you can say that this fragment has the properties of always consuming one element from the stack and always going to push either an empty vector or one on the stack. So checksec consumes two, but you want to reason about the whole fragment. You want to reason before executing the fragment and after. So all the fragment is going to do is always consume one element from the stack, and it's always going to push one or zero, never anything else. Okay, so that's interesting. What do we have else? We have check sequence verify. So it's never going to consume any element on the stack, of course, because otherwise it would not have been set for. Um, it pushes one element, because it does not really push it, but after execution of the, of the fragment, there is one uh, element left over on the stack. It also stops the execution if it's uh, dissatisfied. Then we can, have, we can see that there is the threshold that I was talking about in green over here. You have uh, a counter for counting uh, the policies that were set, the sub policies, the sub fragments that were satisfied. And at the end, you are going to check that the right uh, threshold of them is actually satisfied. But for, for this to work, we want to only add one for each sub fragment, because otherwise we get into the issues that we just saw, where you can just add three and do as if you, you satisfied uh, as many uh, sub fragments as you wanted. You also want all fragments to not take their inputs from the top of the stack, but from one below, and that's what the up swaps are doing here. And uh, did I forget anything? Yeah, they must push exactly one, or they must push zero also. Always push something, because if they don't push anything, then you can't, uh, you can't add them. All right, so what, what I'm trying to get at here is that we have some fragments we uh, have some properties from them, and then we have combiners. We have ways of combining fragments, and those combiners have requirements of properties for the sub fragments. And so we reason only about very small fragments, and we convince ourselves that these small fragments are never going to behave otherwise, and we convince ourselves that as long as any fragment that respects those properties is used inside these combiners, the combiners is going to have the intended, intended semantic. And so that's how we can combine all, minis, uh, all fragments and have a miniscript. So that's, what, that's the corresponding miniscript with this, uh, three out of four sub-fragments 
For the older, as we see, uh, as we saw, it's stopping the execution of the stacks. That's why we have to use a, a DEV uh, type to, in order to be able to uh, dissatisfy it. Because so we, we put it inside an up if here, so that we can dissatisfy by putting a zero here. Otherwise, it would not be able to, to usable inside a, a threshold. So we have plenty of uh, of these fragments and. Uh, all of them have different types and properties, and then we have ways of combining those fragments. All of them require different properties of, uh, out of these fragments, and that's why I was at the beginning of the talk explaining that, that we have different alls and different ends for different uh, conditions. So I'm not going to go into the details, that's never interesting, and I need to get questions. I'm out of time. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that's very basically the intuition. We have subfragments, we determine properties, we have combiners, and we convince ourselves that as long as those properties are going to be respected, anything can be uh, put inside. We have base type, verify type, which is uh, like uh, the check sequence verify, uh, key type for pushing keys, wrapped, which is for inside thresholds, and different properties. So I won't go into the detail of it. And different properties for malleability. Well, I can't go into malleability. Uh, uh, I don't have enough time, but that's uh, interesting as well. So we have different properties for for uh, for inspecting malleability. All right, um, so that was short. But if you want to go further, you can go on a CPAS website that contains all the specification of Miniscript, all the, de uh, the description of, if of, of each of the types, of the defined all the defined fragments, their properties, the uh, requirements uh, in properties of the different combiners. Uh, you have uh, mini scripts and Libera. Uh, if you want to come there and ask questions, that's uh, perfectly fine. All con mini script contributors hang out there. You have the C++, C++ implementation at CPA mini scripts, but now it's part of Bitcoin calls. You have the pro request uh, implementing mini script in Bitcoin calls. That's uh, the Rust implementation. Uh, I've got a well, not very correct implementation in Python, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's not yet completely correct, but maybe it can be easier to read for people more familiar with Python, and it's uh, less unfazed on, on optimization and more about understanding Miniscript. And yeah, you can play with uh, Bitcoin Core. As it's not it's not up, up to date actually. You can play with play with uh, Bitcoin Core 24 right now, and in the, the upcoming version, you'll be able to spend uh, this Miniscript with uh, with uh, Bitcoin Core and try out Liana. It's cool. Thanks. Round of applause, please. Um, do we have any questions? I think you really demonstrated just how hard Bitcoin script is just there. So really well done, Antoine. Um, any questions from the audience there? Any at all? All clear? <laughs> Glad to hear it. Um, yeah, one back there. Cool. I guess I'm interested in how common these errors in Bitcoin script occur on the actual network. And are people regularly exploiting these to get funds? Like miners, are they looking for these scripts and exploiting them? I, I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. Like the examples of the errors in the Bitcoin script, like you know, putting the three to be able to spend uh, two of three uh, scripts without actually having the keys. Are these exploited regularly by miners? Ah, no, so the bug was fixed and it was never used. Well, it was used once on mainnet, but spent. Okay. And we can't really know that nobody is using the old uh, version of Miniscript with box script inside because it's, it's hashed. Uh, but uh, yeah, probably nobody was using it and it was fixed. So. Right. I guess I'm interested more generally, though. Like, Do you think people are looking at the Bitcoin transactions and finding exploits in scripts that they're using to take the money, take funds? Well, I don't know. People exploited the signature analysis back uh, back in 2014 or 15, so I guess they must be looking at uh, satisfactions as well. That's easier even. Yeah. Cool. Time for one more question.